Hello everyone. Uh, good evening. And uh, thank you very much for attending uh, this conference remotely, though. Unfortunately, we uh, had to uh, organize this uh, as a remote conference um, because of the uh, situation. We are so happy to be able to welcome Jean-Yves Bonnefond, who is with me in the, in the room, and Yves Clo, who is uh, listening up uh, uh, remotely. For this uh, conference uh, on work. Now, in line with the uh, the, the work we've been doing uh, uh, at Crash on uh, labor and work, we discovered uh, Jean-Yves Bonnefond and Yves Clos' uh, uh, research, and we thought it uh, relevant to invite them. Uh, they've just published a book which is entitled. Uh, the price of a uh, job well done, trying to uh, emphasize the need for conflict and cooperation in the workplace. And we thought it was worthwhile to disseminate the outcome of their research more widely and how they've been also interacting in uh, companies. Yves Clo is uh, with the CNAM, the National Center for Arts and Trades, is uh, also a researcher, and he heads with Dominique Mullier a, 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 a publication uh, on uh, work clinics. He's published numerous books, and we discovered his work uh, during uh, it, 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 with a, a book entitled uh, really uh, uh, taking work at heart, and it was on psychosocial risks. Jean-Yves Bonnefond is uh, a psychologist specialized in uh, labor, and he heads uh, the uh, Center for Research and Development at CNAM, uh, and also heads uh, Health at Work, uh, um, and he published in 2009, doing something about the quality of work, and he's going to tell us about, uh, about this. He's been working for more than five years in the uh, plant, uh, the Renault factory in Flin, and uh, because he wanted to, uh, to stimulate uh, a dis discussions around the, the real value and quality of work, not only uh, between operators uh, and employees and workers, but also with Renault's top management. So uh, we wanted to have them with us tonight uh, for the, their book, uh, The Price of a Well-Done uh, Job. And uh, they've worked uh, in different uh, environments, the, uh, uh, also the, uh, the uh, municipal uh, waste collection in Lille and also uh, in the nursing home and also in Flin, the Renault factory, just uh, by way of introduction. You may be surprised to uh, see these two people with us tonight. Uh, because obviously their remit and the, the scopes of where they worked uh, in workplaces that are fairly stable uh, as opposed to where we work in our settings uh, uh, which are very unstable and very unpredictable. Uh, these two authors have been working with uh, large companies or um, in well-structured organizations where work is, uh, labor is well-defined, uh, it's uh, timed, and you, th there's not a lot of leeway for discussions, whereas you could argue that MSF people love to uh, have discussions and fight over various issues and disagree uh, very strongly and fiercely in some cases. So we are very happy to have them with us tonight to tell us about the, uh, uh, the major uh, areas uh, of their work, because we think it could, fuel, uh, it could be uh, some fuel for thought for what we do at MSF. We think that uh, there's, uh, uh, firstly, one issue which is very important. Uh, they m this is what they, their take uh, on the situation as work clinicians. And what they say is the following. Um, any operator, any employee, any worker wants to work well. And, uh, you know, when people just shrug their shoulders and, uh, and feel that they, uh, they can't do any, 
otherwise. It's because they feel hindered, they feel that they are hampered, they are prevented from doing their job properly. And it's a source of suffering. And it seems to us that recently MSF for some time now, uh, and more particularly with PSU's team and Nicolas Veilleur's uh, uh, team, uh, or more recently um, in the context of a psychosocial uh, program, uh, a program to prevent psychosocial risks. So it seems to us that we've uh, uh, set up uh, something which is quite far uh, reaching in order to prevent this. And in this regard, uh, we think that these two authors are interesting because they have a very critical approach to uh, psychosocial risk uh, programs because they think that this does split uh, health at, at, at work from the real challenges uh, in the workplace. And I'm sure that Jean-Yves Bonfond will come back to this point, but it seems to us that even uh, such a, um, a corporation as Renault uh, shows some similarities with MSF because it's international, it's, uh, its structure is complex, the profitability criteria also correspond to our budgetary criteria. And um, uh, Jean-Yves Bonfond uh, and uh, his team managed to create uh, spaces for dialogue so that people could discuss about their criteria for defining the quality of work um, and across the hierarchy. And we think it could be a good way for us to tackle some uh, issues that are very topical. And I'll end on this note. If you listen to uh, Sabine Roquefort, uh, back from a mission, and she published this uh, on uh, the Souk uh, website, and she focuses on dialogue, and Sabine says, and I quote, it seems to me that there are fewer and fewer people who are doers, and more and more people telling you what you should do or must do. Uh, doers are in limited number, they don't have any power, they um, just speak out once or twice, and then they you know, they just uh, uh, see that there's nothing much they can do. And uh, so Sabine, uh, is, uh, is, uh, Sabine's uh, article is a wake-up call. And we, we have to make sure that we listen to people who want to work well and so that they don't have to give up uh, and uh, give in. Uh, I'd like to give the floor now to uh, Jean-Yves Bonfond and Yves Claude. They're going to give us some, uh, um, a 45-minute presentation, and then we will open uh, the, uh, the discussion uh, through the chat uh, to take your questions. Now, first, thank you very much for this invitation. Usually, uh, what you start by saying uh, uh, when you address uh, an audience. So, thank you for this invitation. You see, we don't want to give up, we don't want to give in. And thank you very much for your introduction, by the way, um, and also for the, the various exchanges we had with uh, Judith Toussaint. So, we shouldn't just. Uh, uh, give up and uh, accept things uh, as they are. And it's also our job whenever we are called upon to take, to uh, uh, help some organizations. This is our, one of our principles of action. There's no reason why you should uh, deem yourself satisfied with, uh, with the situation and, uh, and uh, just give up. Uh, and deem yourself satisfied. Um, now, I'm going to refer to many organizations, smaller, larger ones, uh, whose ultimate purpose or goal is um, financial profitability. Uh, or sometimes we work with uh, the civil service, whereby, uh, in this case, the ultimate purpose is to comply with regulations or budget constraints. So the situations are quite different from yours, but it's, uh, 
it's very exciting to be able to uh, um, see what could be done uh, uh, at MSF because on paper it seems that there is a difference as far as the ultimate goal is concerned, uh, the f you know the uh, purpose. Uh, in your case, well, at least uh, uh, this is what you say, and I think this is what you do, um, despite the various constraints. So your purpose uh, is to execute your social mission, your humanitarian, uh, um, to serve your humanitarian cause, if I may put it that way. So it's interesting to see uh, uh, how you deal with that. And we are going to share with you uh, what we see elsewhere um, where, in organizations where uh, people uh, are faced with uh, constraints uh, which are uh, such that, uh, you know, because of financial problems, because of uh, the financial goals or because of the regulations, there's no other way of doing things and uh, that it makes things very difficult. And, of course, one may imagine that your purpose is different. Um, but there, there may be something that you want to cure, uh, uh, cure quote unquote, in the, your workplace if you have called on us. And uh, I would like to, uh, um, before uh, give, handing over to Jean-Yves Jean Bonnefond, I think the, the, really the end of the game for us is to go beyond or to leave the beaten tracks of uh, just looking at health and safety. And we, we've seen that in the uh, latest report uh, from the uh, National Agency on Work uh, Conditions, Working Conditions. Well, they argue that the industrial relation agreements uh, that were signed in 2013 uh, can be heavily criticized because of uh, its approach of uh, quality uh, of work and, and quality in the workplace uh, and also, of course, uh, combined with uh, psychosocial risks. That is too peripheral, in fact. Uh, these, uh, the, these agreements uh, look uh, don't focus on the quality of the actions uh, themselves uh, or they don't consider the fact that people have to make do with jobs that are not well done and that it's because they, there's no other way for them and, uh, uh, and, and you, need to, to, you need to take that into account. Uh, if, and just to come back to the point, you, 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 what you said, taking your work at heart is the best prevention you can have um, to prevent psychosocial risks or to uh, enhance quality of life at work. So not giving up, not accepting the situation, uh, not having to, um, to just uh, do your job in a way which is not the proper one. Because if you, uh, if you can see that uh, uh, the job is not a job well done and the quality of your work is not satisfactory, it's something uh, which is going to um, eat you up. It's going to uh, be a source of suffering. Uh, but over to uh, Jean-Yves Bonnefond and then I'll say a few words uh, uh, after he's uh, completed uh, his uh, uh, talk. Thank you very much, Clément, for your introduction. And thank you to Yves Clo for the preamble. Um, I, I think it's, uh, uh, it's wonderful because I can, go, uh, I, I can focus right away on health. Um, health is really at the heart of our approach. I know that, uh, well, obviously, the question of health is uh, at the very heart of what you do uh, within MSF, all, all of you doctors. So I want to tread carefully here, you see. Uh, however, as Clément was, uh, was saying uh, by way of introduction, we, 
are the way we uh, we look at health is not uh, a traditional one. Uh, it's not conventional. Health is not the uh, uh, absence of disease. And it's something which is different from the psychosocial risk approach. Because we look at health um, um, in reg with regard to uh, what your ability to be an agent, your ability to act uh, and have an action on the world and produce your environment to be able to have a life and not just barely survive or adapt yourself to your environment. And if you take this approach, uh, you can see that health uh, in the workplace is something which is very different from what is done usually. Because health in the workplace, health at work means that you feel effective. You feel that you, you, have, you do make a difference, both individually and collectively. And that, well, at least from time to time, you are a true agent of your workplace. You can uh, have a bearing, uh, bring something about in your work environment. And in 2017, the DARES, uh, the agency, a labor agency, showed that uh, the depression risk diminishes whenever employees are, can contribute to decision making uh, at work. So being able to uh, have an action on your work and, uh, and also do something uh, that uh, defines you so that you can be proud of what you do. Well, this is something which is good for your health, you see. Um, uh, being, and it means that health is uh, really uh, upstream of disease. And if you can't be proud of what you do, if you are regularly and chronically exposed to the inability to take action or contribute to, what, to your work, or that you can't identify with what you are asked to do. You may not be sick or ill, but your health is at risk, and you can't, it can't go on like that. Uh, which makes us say that in a certain way, work, uh, working, work well done is the key between health of the professionals or the person at work and the quality of the commodity produced, in a certain way, the quality and the effectiveness of the organization. And when we talk about work well done, we talk about the virus study, which dates from 2014, which shows that a third of the employees say that they feel no pride in a, a job well done. They don't, that's an average. There are some places which, where it's even more, more marked. Now, once, uh, where, where, now having presented things in that manner, it also defines a trajectory of action, how to be able to take care of the work, and how not to, n not to justify. Uh, uh, and to be amputated from the possibility of acting, uh, and which harms uh, uh, effectiveness and quality. Now, uh, that is a radically different approach, and uh, and the opposite of the of the prevention of the prevention of psychosocial uh, risks, and we focus more on the symptoms. And how can we detect? The, those who are not who are not well. How do we try to spot a, any fragility with uh, with people and to spot the ones who are not well? We train the events, uh, various events, uh, to emphasize the body and the mind, uh, and in the end, to help and support people who are in this state. 
Now, once we've said that, uh, we, we, once we say that, we can support that the, the reason for the action and for prevention is the, is the very topic of work itself. Up until now, we've talked like in a hygienic way. We talk about the people, we talk about people who, who make problems, make waves at work. But, uh, but, but in fact, it's not the, the wave makers that we are concerned about, but in the event itself. And so the relationship between health and activity, we can see that there is uh, uh, pressure on work. But we focus on the people, their, their fragileness, and their psych psychological support that we can give them. And we go from that. We're going to talk about the edges of the work itself, but not the job it, uh, itself. And we're going to be talking more about the symptoms than, than the problem. And so that's a kind of a hy hygienic approach. The other, the other approach uh, is the issue of the quality of life at work. Mm -hmm. And all, all the programs and the processes, uh, once again, as Yves Clove said, uh, in, in, in the international, interprofessional report, it's written in the relationship between what is written and what is acted upon, and what is written in the national uh, interprofessional uh, agreements. Uh, there is a link between the quality of the work and the quality uh, derived from work, and, and and there's a heavy tendency to in the major part of the work uh, about the the environment the work environment etc uh, and there's also kind of uh, hygienism as well uh, where we invite the topics uh, to take care of themselves to eat well sleep well and take care of their bodies and from the point of view of the mind, uh, how we could support them, help them in personal development and in the processes of uh, introspective processes, how we, can, uh, we, how we can cope with stress and to relax. And so in all the poss possible uh, processes in, in, in the uh, thing, but and see how the process is going to care, uh, be way on the topic, independently of the work itself, which, as I would say, which is at the source of development or suffering, or uh, potential suffering, which is why when we work well done, when we say that then the relationship between health and uh, of the person and and the quality of the production and the effectiveness of the organization. Once we've said that, it, we we reach a. Uh, it, it's it's good that we that we find the solution because the quality of work. we can sort of uh, gather around the idea that uh, it is something which is shared uh, if work is well done. It's even, first of all, present in everyone that we, uh, in an organization, uh, we're not there just to do anything, but we, but the quality of the work is, is a reward, it's a solution because it uh, unites people and uh, it also helps them share and it enables them to link with one another uh, in their work, uh, like the operators, the agencies, the managers, the supervisors, uh, the managers, and the support functions, and uh, unions. Uh, and that can link all of that together uh, around the quality of work. But it's not as simple as that. Easier said than done. And uh, in the case, cases we studied, it often is very complicated because of the quality of work, even if it's a, a unifier, but it can also divide people because it's a thing, it's a conflictual thing. If it's somebody who said, uh, what, uh, how can you define uh, work well done? The criteria for uh, work well done we we can't completely have the same constructs uh, in an organization and the criteria vary and they diverge in many situations 
the uh, people are in conflict and the quality of the work in the end is that of uh, is going to win out over uh, over choices between us of the criteria in any given situation and so the quality of the work is an affair of uh, conflict it's normal and and that's why we call uh, the 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 book the the conflictual cooperation in an organization as soon as you you have to be able to own in an organization these divergencies the divergences and the criteria the varying criteria not because it's good or bad to 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 think about it but but because it's a, a great uh, energy source a source of creativity and potentially uh, in, uh, improve uh, effectiveness on the condition, and this is where it becomes more complicated, on the condition to, to, to find a, an average of a satisfaction. And because some organizations are not equipped, but, but there is no institution to be able to uh, live socially uh, uh, th uh, but except through cooperation, when people are left on their own in an organization, uh, in the end, what happens? There's no means to be able to discuss this, and this th that finishes between conflicts, conflicts between people, and it starts to affect bodies and minds of uh, of individuals, and uh, things go go, uh, go badly. And our, our approach is to try to find this problem at its root. how in organizations how we can look directly at this problem as a solution by looking directly at it and how can we do uh, quality work uh, uh, as a means of cooperation and that is a uh, and that's a problem because work carried out uh, that we do at the CNAM the conservatory of several years uh, it takes place at a discussable level but that it enabled us to see that when we take the problem from this point of view from organizations who ask for it uh, with patience and determination, it requires time, and we manage to produce the results. We can generate cooperation on relying on this conflictuality for the improvement of uh, work quality. Now, before uh, viewing a short film to give you a very uh, re in re to show you in real terms this kind of uh, way of of acting, this kind of dialogue that we create, and so before looking at the uh, short video, there there will be two. In fact, we uh, I want to specify that the methodology is always applied on on the relationship between the the, the realist uh, action uh, that c can possibly be and organized dialogues between uh, colleagues uh, fellow workers that is the conflicts in the trade uh, within an organization uh, in in a homogenous uh, collective meeting that the result of this dialogue and the and the questions which are asked are then given to uh, to dis discuss at various levels uh, in the organization there are st th these are two registers that is dialogue between coworkers and then open up the dialogue in the organization and if it works and when it works to work on building in the uh, professional environment the organizational resources and the committees that may will make this uh, lasting in the organization. So I, I want now to talk, come back to 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 to, to some real cases, uh, and this uh, we did this at the uh, car factory in in Flan, the Renault factory. But I don't want to delay too long about how we got to. I'm not going to explain how we went to the to the factory, but as you're going to see, 
Now, this is obviously very far from the MSF's activities. I think uh, in these situations, there is a, a means for fueling, an interesting comparison between uh, MSF and, say, Renault, uh, and the requirements that exist at MSF, obviously in foreign countries, in a lot of chaos, as has already been mentioned. Uh, but it, it might serve a purpose to talk about this, to make a comparison between the two, MSF and the working world. And so this was the door uh, fitting, door fitting uh, uh, workshop at the uh, factory. And we're at the stage where you can discuss between the operators on the, uh, on the, um, on, on the work, on the chain and also with their concerns. And so these are players are going to talk about this or that. We're going to talk about a request of the operational people, of their concerns, and it's it's between them, and then eventually beyond that. These are always questions which are absolutely real uh, in terms of the of the working environment. Uh, so that's our starting point the reality of the, of the dialogue between colleagues. And so if you would put on the film uh, in the factory, the, the door fitting uh, workshop. Look at look at what I was telling you about by by fitting the door. You don't check. You're not paying attention if your if the hinge is well fit fitted or not. I know that uh, Papa uh, does this method as well. When you look, the I, I I pull it down. As if I, I this level uh, uh, this level of the door. I'm sorry, I, I, I'm not understanding this. The dialogue's too hazy. And so the gap between the hinge and the door, and I think that's something we have to overcome. I, I think his method might be faster, but uh, I think there's a, there's a danger of it being a bit sloppier. In the other team, uh, they, they never hit it like that. When I trained Hamid, it was about 10, uh, 10 minutes, and I found that that was faster uh, than, hit, than, than, than hitting it. It, it avoids uh, wounding, uh, hurting yourself, be, uh, because the ten, your 10 fingers are exposed. I prefer that the, for the man to, to remain behind my back. So the riveter, uh, we, we waste an enormous amount of time. The job, uh, even if there were, uh, I have it, the molars, he have used the the, uh, the the automatic screwdriver. This would be faster, and even if they increase the others, you're going to be able to uh, to to set down the riveter. Without the riveter, you put the the molars, and uh, and you're going to save time. If you're doing a lot of work with the riveter, 
you're going to make a lot of uh, movements to go find it and then to bring it back and to we, we waste an enormous amount of time just to uh, just to uh, set two rivets yeah we know but that uh, it, it makes you waste a lot of time uh, if, uh, to, just to be able to get to the next door, for example, it's uh, I, I don't uh, the, the the people who do the FOS that is the standard. Uh, they saw they saw very well how it goes. See see if they can save time with the riveter. And so you're not optimizing necessarily on the chain line uh, the the assembly line. We do the installation, but I think this can lead to, uh, to more efficient, more, more effective results. But the job uh, itself, but, uh, but if somebody else comes in with a different method, that can, bo uh, that can really uh, bugger things up a little bit. Have you already talked about that? No, because it's just the way we did it. It doesn't serve any purpose to talk about it. That the job is that's how the job is. And so we're at this uh, level of the of collective work uh, on the the development level. We're not talking about the prevention of risk, of psychosocial risk. We're talking about the development of psychological risk, uh, psychological aspects of it. When the professionals can do that in a framework like that, <clears throat> it's a good thing. When they can dialogue like that, and this makes it possible to 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 benefit uh, people among themselves to find the best possible. <clears throat> and to uh, pr properly develop their job, it also makes it possible to diagnose the problems of effectiveness and quality and to imagine mutual solutions. And so, as you heard, the diagnosis uh, of the following step, there were pr health problems and also the product sometimes is spoiled the second thing is the toxic uh, chemicals used on it. The, the 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 useful the usefulness of speaking is you can see the, the advantage. On the one hand, they're not able to do something which is going to uh, it's, it hurts people, but if we if we mention it, then in a certain way there's kind of a double punishment, and and it's a kind of poison. Um, this isn't a Renault's fault, and it's a toxic. It's toxic because if Reno is talking about that, then it makes it possible to uh, it makes it impossible to speak if if they don't reach out and and t talk among 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 themselves, and this fuels uh, a chronic mistrust and, and lasting t toward the organization toward the company. Ensuite, là, ce qu'on entend. And then what we can see uh, from these, uh, with these employees is that they are highly professional and smart. And they, but th there's nothing that is available to them, no organization that is in place in the company to listen to them and take advantage of their uh, cleverness and intelligence, but once you start talking to these people and there are uh, discussions, then you start talking to the uh, employees' representatives, the management's representatives, the uh, plant manager. So you open up the discussions on this basis. And we, uh, we I've given you uh, the example of what we did at Renault, but uh, you can find it everywhere. Every organization finds it difficult to meet the, uh, the employees' expectations and their will to contribute to the discussion. 
And usually, of course, it is unsettling for the top management. But it's also a positive thing because uh, uh, it's an incentive for them to try and solve the problems. Now, I, I, to cut a long story short, this is what happened in this particular shop floor at uh, Renault Flin. The top management uh, were invited to participate in the discussions and the middle management were also invited to uh, hold these discussions with the operators. A and the top managers told them, told the middle management, you should go on discussing with them. And it had an, Im an impact on the tooling, on uh, also the design of some parts for Clio, the Clio 4, the, the, uh, the, the small uh, uh, city car by Renault, uh, the Clio. So it, it changed things. But of course, uh, uh, you could argue, well, it's all very well, uh, but this was uh, an, a sort of experiment conducted with psychologists, and maybe you can't reproduce it elsewhere. But the second step is to see what the organization can do in order to make this um, sustainable, to have a, an organization that enables dialogue to take place. So that people can have discussions on the problems, uh, can s uh, set out the priorities, and also uh, an organization that is put in place so that the uh, the you know the rank and file uh, employees are not stuck without any possibility to speak out. And this is how they decided to create a new uh, uh, job position, a new position, um, what they call an ambassador, a trade ambassador, or a métier advisor, um, a métier focal point. Uh, these people uh, are uh, participate in the discussions and they, their mission, uh, they are interested by their colleagues to um, get the message across. Now, I'm going to show you another footage. Uh, you are going to see one of these ambassadors uh, and uh, there are also support function people and also uh, his line managers are present during the discussions because there, there was a, a problem uh, and I'm explaining all this to you because it, it's a way to better understand. In fact, uh, it's uh, a problem that they, they have uh, in the Clio uh, car and the Zoe and uh, they, have, they have a problem with, with one, of these, uh, uh, one of these shafts uh, it's a, it's a cardan shaft, and, uh, and uh, they want to talk about this because this, uh, this transmission, this drive, uh, is, uh, is not easy. Uh, um, so, but, well, I leave you to take a look at this. You're going to see the problem revolves around this shaft, which isn't, it's, it's not handy at all, the way things are, are planned. And it's also the transmission, because w w you're the last one to take to, to on the line, and uh, you have to you really have to bend. Well, I would love to uh, to to agree with you, but I think it's very difficult because uh, then what you are asking for is to have all the shafts. The transmission shafts on a, on tables that are higher, so it means um, a, a lot of problems. It means something difficult. This and uh, the one of the un, uh, the this is now the uh, uh, focal point. The ambassador who is explaining because the right hand side transmission is is longer. 
say if we were to uh, have pairs of uh, shafts, then we would have to modify a lot of things and we would have to modify all the separation. Now, this guy is in charge of uh, uh, supply uh, uh, quality, uh, for, uh, quality from suppliers. Well, uh, you, you see these packages are designed in that way for a reason. Uh, and with the transmission, you, because the length is different, then you would have to use a different packaging. Uh, the uh, shop floor manager says, uh, can I ask a question? Well, uh, you know, you could use the same package for a Clio. So you see, you have to go around, and this is what you have to do. You see, you're right, you're right. Because there are two different packaging, two different packages, and it's true. We could put them, and but then the thing is, it, it can't, it can't move, can it? Well, uh, we have to think about it. I think it's not going to be easy. But if it's for the for the same lines, I can't see why uh, it, it, it wouldn't be feasible. I, I just want to leave it there and just give you my conclusion after this very short footage. What you have to understand about these discussions they are having these discussions, they can take place only because it, it's based on something which is organized, you see, formalized. Uh, and the operator, the ambassador, the métier ambassador um, is a, a guy who's been a temp worker in many different uh, factories, uh, car factories. So he's not very, uh, it's not a high ranking uh, employee, but he's very experienced. And his colleagues asked him to explain the problem to the management. But you see, this is possible because the company made it possible for these conf conflicting criteria can be uh, put on the table. And all I want to say uh, by way of conclusion is that uh, since 2015, this sort of uh, organized discussion uh, is something that exists everywhere in the factory in Flins. And then we'll take some questions. But I'm sure that you've got everything you need to know thanks to uh, Jean-Yves' talk. But I just want to... Uh, say two things. Uh, firstly, to uh, to confirm that we 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 have this radical criticism of the uh, conventional psychosocial risk approach. If I were to uh, s say uh, say it differently, uh, a, 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 as a joke, I'd say that all these action plans. Uh, you see uh, this, the wealth of action plans that are, uh, or a lot of them, let's say, that you can see mushrooming in companies. And it's something which is overwhelming in organizations. But the biggest problem they have, all these action plans, is that they don't consider the actions themselves, whereas we look at things, we look at it from the different 
from a different point of view, from the point of view of the uh, employees themselves, from the workers themselves. From the but you see, traditionally in companies, in, in organizations, when social dialogue, industrial relations are mentioned, it's always with a view to reaching a consensus, reaching a trade-off, a compromise. But usually, uh, you know, each side has got a, a well, uh, deeply rooted uh, position. This is not what we want. This is not what we want to promote. We want to promote real dialogical uh, performance. Which means that in order, you know, in order to make up your, you, you discuss with others in order to make up your minds. Because you're trying to look for something new. And because you want to come up with something that no one had thought of previously. And I even go as far as saying that the only dialogue which can qualify as a true exercise of dialogue and of course, I'm not giving you a psychological uh, le uh, lecture here, but the true, authentic, genuine dialogue is a dialogue that enables all parties to exchange and find something that no one had had in mind at the start of discussion. This is what a dialogical uh, approach means. So as you were shown with the first sequence, First, the operators uh, discuss things among themselves, and then uh, they uh, explain the problem to either the line managers or the top managers. But of course, you have to run the risk of uh, maybe uh, um, finding a solution no one had thought of, and then um, try it out and validate it an experiment, and Jean-Yves said so, you know, solutions must be validated by the operators themselves because they, they should be the ones who say whether these innovations are valid and relevant or not. Now, thank you very much for uh, listening. Now, thank you so much, Yves Clo. Thank you, Jean-Yves Bonnefond. Now we're going to uh, take some time for uh, uh, discussions. No, just to, for everybody to understand how you can ask a question, you can raise your hand. There's a toolbar at the bottom of your Zoom screen and our technicians here can open your microphone uh, if you have uh, raised your hand and I uh, give you the floor. It's also possible for you to uh, key in your questions in the chat, though, of course, it's, uh, it may be easier and, uh, and uh, more and friendlier to you if you ask these questions uh, orally. I'd like to give the floor to Judith Sousson. She wanted very much to ask the first question. Thank you very much, Clément. No, I, uh, well, I was not very keen on asking the first question, but I just wanted to keep the ball rolling, maybe. So thank you uh, very much for your talks. Uh, I'm sure that a lot of people uh, uh, may feel quite excited and, uh, and enthusiastic about what we've just heard, but also that it's sort of a bit hazy how we can um, th r relate this uh, to uh, MSF. But one question uh, came to my mind. 
you, you told us about this new function, new position that was created, the uh, referent métier, or the métier ambassador, the trade focal point, uh, however you'd like to call it. So it's a, like, this person is like a catalyst and make sure that the various um, approaches or conflicting criteria on how to work well uh, and how to make sure that work is uh, well done, well, become ambassadors. And uh, these ambassadors can get the message across to the uh, um, higher uh, uh, levels of the hierarchy. We also uh, uh, took a few hints from Christophe de Jour on uh, how a manager should uh, listen to a team and be aware of the uh, various constraints that are felt by the team members. Uh, and Christophe de Jour uh, maybe has an approach which can, uh, which is not so far away from yours. Uh, and so he defines and describes what could be the quote-unquote ideal manager. So why wouldn't it be possible for such an, uh, a good manager, uh, an ideal manager, to do the same thing as a, uh, a, a trade ambassador or a METI ambassador? Because this manager would be very close to people, would... Uh, uh, would really uh, be uh, aware of the way they work and would be in a position to investigate the various conflicting criteria. And of course, there are so many different teams uh, within MSF, but let's say that uh, if you consider a team uh, in the field and very often with uh, expats and, uh, and uh, also a coordinator. And these are um, multidisciplinary teams with, uh, um, with maybe uh, uh, criteria that are conflicting and different, uh, different expertise uh, and different métiers. So in a nutshell, my question, question why uh, couldn't uh, such a, an ideal manager uh, do the same job as a métier ambassador, uh, as described in your conditions sine qua non euh, de ce travail que vous faites au sein de collectifs qui sont homogènes, avec des gens qui sont des pairs, qui ont le même métier et qui débattent. Euh, les, les ouvriers qu'on voit, ils, ils font le même métier sur la porte. Euh, et, et donc, euh, en quoi euh, des situations d'équipe pluridisciplinaire euh, posent des questions euh, différentes selon vous Là, je ne sais pas comment on fait entre Yves et moi. Euh, vas-y, vas-y, vas-y. <rire> Sans le masque. Hein. Ouais. Enfin, tu vas... eh, mais tu peux le faire si tu veux, Jean-Yves. Hein peux... Non, non, mais je, je, je veux bien... Euh... Euh, rebondir euh, donc sur, euh, sur je, je, il y a deux questions la question de l'encadrement ou du manager euh, alors le, le, le référent métier ne remplace pas le manager hein, euh, ça c'est hyper important euh, c'est pas contre hiérarchique tout ça euh, euh, par contre la, la, la ligne managériale elle, est, elle, est, euh, elle a une fonction qui est quand même celle de faire valoir, de, 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 de légitimer et à juste titre et de prioriser euh, des critères qui viennent de la ligne hiérarchique par définition. Euh, donc euh, un manager, euh, ce chef d'atelier par exemple, euh, lui, il n'a il a des. il n'a pas la main, j'allais dire, sur, sur les arbitrages. Euh, si, aussi talentueux soit-il, euh, aussi bienveillant soit-il. Euh, euh, et même si on lui donne les moyens de faire cette réunion, admettons, ce qui, ce qui, est, ce qui est déjà un défi hein, dans des organisations comme ça, de trouver le temps et l'organisation, eh bien, il, il, euh, le, le bon manager, euh, il ne suffira pas. Le, ce qu'on ne voit pas bien dans le film-là, c'est qu'un problème qui ne se traite pas à ce niveau-là doit pouvoir 
euh, migrer à l'instance supérieure. Et ça, qui décide de ça Vous voyez, euh, est-ce que c'est le manager qui dit je suis court, euh, je vais, je vais euh, monter vers mon N plus pour lui dire que j'y arrive Ou lui dire quoi Lui dire il y a un problème, lui dire j'arrive pas à le régler. Euh, euh, c'est très compliqué cette affaire-là. Dans les dispositifs qu'on qu fabrique, soit la chose, elle, elle trouve solution là, soit par définition, elle doit, elle doit, elle doit migrer à un autre niveau, indépendamment euh, des personnes. Et par contre, toujours avec la possibilité pour, le référent de mé... pour, pour ces référents métiers de circuler dans les instances. Ça va jusqu'au dialogue social à, 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 à l'usine Renault de Flin. Vous avez un, une commission tripartite, euh, d'une part, et un comité de direction mensuel avec euh, une référente, en l'occurrence, euh, qui, qui, qui euh, euh, comment, euh, récolte tous les problèmes qui n'arrivent pas à être résolus aux différents étages de la ligne hiérarchique pour qu'ils pu, puissent être discutés au plus haut niveau. Si, si on est dans le, dans, la traditionnelle, dans le traditionnel fonctionnement hiérarchique, j'allais dire, toutes les organisations, contempor... enfin, toutes les organisations devraient d'ailleurs bien fonctionner. Euh, C'est parce que la question n'est pas là, la question est celui du conflit de critères. Donc euh, nous, on, est, on, 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 a, on a renoncé hein, à l'idée que, que ce soit euh, parce que des bons managers, voire des, des héros d'ailleurs, hein, ça finit par être des héros, parce que plus vous descendez dans la, dans la ligne hiérarchique, plus vous avez un manager qui a peu de pouvoir sur la, dans l'organisation et qui a par contre une somme de conflictualité à gérer dans le rapport au réel. Et ça fait de lui, euh, euh, j'allais dire, il est pas loin, normalement, il, il finit en court-circuit ou alors c'est un héros euh, qui a des solutions qu'on n'a pas. Euh, euh, L'autre question, c'est la question du collectif. Euh, les équipes pluridisciplinaires, j'avoue que moi, pour, dans, dans les discussions qu'on a eues, et même ce que vous nous avez donné à lire, ça m'a fait réfléchir euh, sur une équipe loin de, loin de France, enfin même si maintenant il y a toutes les communications, avec, euh, j'allais dire, que euh, des spécialistes, on va dire, euh, métiers et, et pas de collectif. Voilà. Ben, je trouve que c'est une bonne question euh, que, que j'aurais envie de, de, de retourner à MSF. Comment, comment chaque spécialiste euh, cultive ce, le collectif qu'il a en lui Parce que ce qu'on fabrique, vous voyez, dans, la, dans, le premier, dans le premier montage que vous voyez, pourquoi on insiste là-dessus euh, Parce que c'est une condition, euh, c'est presque ce dialogue-là avec ses collègues, c'est ce, ce qui développe la capacité à être seul en situation. C'est-à-dire euh, pouvoir rentrer en dialogue avec d'autres critères, d'autres métiers, d'autres spécialistes, ça c'est difficilement possible si on est euh, l'acteur singulier qui n'a pas en lui quelque chose du dialogue euh, avec ses pairs autour de ces, toutes ces situations traversées. Donc moi j'aurais envie de dire comment, comment MSF cultive ce rapport-là Et je trouve que c'est une question, franchement, moi, si, euh, je, ça m'intéresserait beaucoup. Le médecin isolé, euh, le logisticien, l'infirmière, euh, comment euh, ce triptyque-là, et puis euh, RH, enfin, peut-être d'autres, euh, comment euh, se retrouve, se, se, ne se retrouve-t-il ou elle pas seule avec des conflits de critères propres à son activité dans des, dans des environnements extrêmement compliqués, tendus et euh, à, à être isolé à, et même à penser que tout, tout vient de lui quoi euh, tout vient de lui voilà ça euh, voilà donc c'est l'étage voilà je m'arrête là après peut-être Yves j'ai pris trop la parole <rire> oui, oui, oui. Je, je vais ajouter mon grain de sel hein. euh, vous avez raison de, de, de euh, Judith de, de... De, de, de nous poser la question de, de, de la différence avec l'approche de Christophe Dejour. C'est une, une bonne question. Euh, Imaginez-vous qu'on se l'est posé bien souvent. Quoi. Et or, c'est un point absolument capital. C'est un point capital. Euh, Ce n'est pas la voie qu'on a choisie, celle du, du, du manager à l'écoute. Euh, Peut-être parce que... <coughs> on n'a plus beaucoup de naïveté sociale. Et peut-être parce que l'expérience a montré que ça fait ça, euh, reposer sur le manager de proximité euh, euh, une sorte d'abstraction euh, du conflictuel. Quoi. Voilà. Ça, ça, ça le met dans une position euh, qu'a décrite euh, Jean-Yves Bonnefant, c'est-à-dire que ça le charge considérablement. Quoi. Voilà. Euh, et puis, il y a un, euh, ça c'est côté manager mais il y a côté collectif fondamentalement pour moi en tout cas c'est le problème de la liberté euh, c'est pas vrai que 
un manager peut faire le tour des postes et se rapprocher du travail réel. Euh, euh, je ne dis même pas sans, sans formater l'échange, hein, je ne dis même pas ça, bien sûr, c'est déjà ça. Euh, Imaginez-vous imaginez le chef qui commence à mettre son nez euh, dans les petites affaires de chacun. Hein. C'est même pas ça, c'est que euh, pour que le conflit de critères interne au collectif, qu'on a vu dans la première séquence, pour que le conflit de critères interne au collectif émerge, <coughs> j'allais dire pour qu'il soit poussé jusqu'au bout, hein, de façon à ce qu'on trouve l'angle mort. Parce que le problème, c'est trouver l'angle mort. Quoi. Faire le tour de la question, c'est trouver l'angle mort. Pour que ça soit possible, il faut que ça se passe en toute liberté et tranquillement, j'allais presque dire à l'abri, entre connaisseurs. Et il y a des gens qui, sont, euh, qui font le même job. Quoi. Hein euh, je laisse de côté la question de, de, de l'interdisciplinarité qui a été évoquée tout à l'heure. Hein Mais des gens, qui, des gens qui sont passés par les mêmes épreuves quoi. Voilà. Et, et, et qui, d'une certaine manière, euh, peuvent à ce moment-là euh, prendre des libertés entre eux avec leurs habitudes. Parce que pour prendre des libertés avec ses habitudes, il faut être tranquille. Et surtout, il faut avoir, euh, avec son interlocuteur, une sorte de, 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 de pacte que seul le, le réel de, de l'activité permet d'avoir. C'est parce qu'on a fréquenté les mêmes galères, parce qu'on on a traversé les mêmes épreuves, que d'une certaine manière, on peut euh, s'autoriser, entre collègues, à prendre des libertés avec ses habitudes. Or, c'est fondamental que les opérationnels de premier niveau ne se rassemblent pas simplement pour dire au chef ce qui ne va pas, qui est la démarche euh, euh, classique en psychodynamique du travail, hein, euh, mais qu'ils se rassemblent pour changer leur manière de faire, euh, pour prendre des libertés avec leurs habitudes entre eux. S'ils font ça, alors ils, sont, ils font davantage autorité, parce que d'une certaine manière, ils peuvent ensuite, et c'est absolument capital, retourner vers le chef, l'encadrement de proximité, et parce qu'ils ont pris des libertés avec leurs propres habitudes, euh, euh, j'allais dire donner l'exemple et, et, et proposer au chef d'en prendre lui-même des libertés avec ses habitudes et surtout de prendre des libertés avec les habitudes euh, de ceux qui le dirigent lui-même. Donc autrement dit, il faut jouer le conflit de critères. C'est ce conflit de critères-là qui est propulsif euh, et moteur. Ça, c'est ma, ma première réponse. Elle est clinique, hein elle est fondée sur l'expérience. La deuxième, elle est, elle est plus vaste, elle est plus sociale, parce que euh, l'idée qu'un manager puisse, euh, d'une certaine manière, animer avec empathie euh, un groupe de ses, co de ses collaborateurs et les écouter, et, euh, ça a déjà été fait. C'est les lois aux roues. Les lois Ouro avaient prévu que euh, des, des groupes d'expression, ça s'appelait comme ça, hein, ça s'appelait même des groupes d'expression directs, euh, se réunissent euh, avec les managers. C'était comme ça, la loi Ouro, c'est celle-là. Et, et très rapidement, il a suffi de quatre ou cinq ans après, il y a eu les, premières, euh, les premiers diagnostics sur l'échec de ce dispositif. Et le, le, le diagnostic était extrêmement clair. C'est un, un diagnostic qui avait été fait par un, par un, un, un député socialiste, hein, c'est une commission d'enquête parlementaire, qui avait établi quoi Qui avait établi, euh, euh, d'une certaine manière, qui avait prévu la, la dégénérescence des lois au roux, hein, et qui disait, euh, euh, quand il y a un rapport direct qui s'installe entre euh, ceux qui viennent au groupe d'expression et le manager, euh, ce qui se passe, c'est que, les différents qui existent, c'est-à-dire les conflits de critères entre opérationnels de premier niveau. Euh, ces conflits de critères ne sont pas sur la table parce que les, 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 ceux qui sont présents dans le groupe d'expression, qui n'ont pas eu le temps de, et la liberté d'être tranquillement entre eux, ne sont pas bien sûrs que lorsqu'ils vont dire quelque chose à leur chef, ils ne vont pas trahir leurs collègues. Euh, et ils ne vont pas mettre leurs collègues qui leur ont pas donné de mandat euh, sur la base d'une réunion spécifique entre eux, ils ne ils, ils sont pas bien sûrs de ne pas mettre leurs collègues en difficulté. Donc, ils se taisent. 
Et la, les lois au roux sont mortes de la parole inutile euh, de ces opérateurs, de ces groupes d'expression qui ne sont pas parvenus à instruire avec leur encadrement, et c'est très important hein, d'instruire avec l'encadrement. Ils ne sont pas parvenus à le faire parce que, d'une certaine manière, c'était mal instruit entre eux et qu'ils n'avaient pas seulement le, pas le temps, mais pas la liberté de le faire. D'où l'importance de, de ne pas mélanger les genres, quoi, si je peux dire. Euh, il, il faut que les opérationnels aient la liberté entre eux de prendre la liberté avec leurs propres habitudes. Parce que s'ils font ça, ils vont se trouver... Euh, plus intelligents encore qu'ils ne se croyaient eux-mêmes. Et ils vont se, donc se trouver plus forts. Ça leur donne de la puissance, finalement, d'être créatifs entre eux. Et parce qu'ils sont créatifs entre eux, d'une certaine manière, ensuite, ils peuvent discuter plus, plus efficacement avec, euh, avec la hiérarchie qui doit effectivement arbitrer dans des instances qu'on a évoquées. Si on est arrivé à, à fabriquer ces, cette, cette, euh, cette, euh, cette architecture d'instances, euh, c'est précisément parce qu'on a tiré les enseignements de l'illusion, hein, je le dis comme je le pense, de l'illusion qu'il y a qu'il euh, suffit qu'un bon chef soit bienveillant, bien formé et qu'il soit à l'écoute. Euh, c'est une illusion, c'est une, euh, une illusion euh, sympathique, hein, euh, mais ça sous-estime à quel point euh, il faut travailler euh, et, hum, comment dirais-je, transformer le conflit en méthode de coopération. Euh, c'est ça qui est important, c'est que la coopération, ça passe par l'instruction du conflit de critères, euh, chacun à son niveau. Voilà. Donc, euh, je revendique la différence de ce point de vue-là avec euh, l'idéal du, du, du manager euh, bienveillant. Je n'y crois pas. Non, et je, je, je pense que ça donne au manager un une fonction et un rôle euh, qui n'est pas le sien parce qu'un un manager ce n'est pas, pas un psychologue l'écoute euh, c'est bien gentil mais un manager ça doit fabriquer de l'efficacité, ça doit trouver la performance, ça doit rendre des comptes et c'est dans toutes les organisations c'est comme ça et, et d'une certaine manière je, je, je pense que ça sera pour longtemps comme ça donc, il faut accepter que tout ça est conflictuel. Et surtout, il faut demander aux opérationnels de travailler sur leurs différences entre eux pour imaginer des choses auxquelles ils n'avaient pas pensé entre eux. Voilà. Vous voyez, la liberté que, que je revendique pour eux, ce n'est pas n'importe quelle liberté. Hein. C'est la liberté de prendre des libertés avec ses habitudes, c'est-à-dire de se transformer. Et il faut que les opérationnels de premier niveau... Euh, euh, fassent cette expérience-là. Parce qu'ensuite, ils peuvent le réclamer et même revendiquer qu'au-dessus, on la fasse aussi. Voilà, c'est ma, ma réponse. Elle est à la fois clinique, c'est le résultat d'une expérience, et elle est à la fois sociale, parce que les lois aux roues sont un échec. Et donc, l'idée que des groupes d'expression doivent être animés par les managers euh, 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 a fait faillite. C'est un fait, c'est ça qui a plombé les, les lois aux roues, et c'est grave d'ailleurs, hein, parce qu'elles sont encore dans le droit du travail, euh, c'est encore un article du, de, 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 du Code du travail, hein, la possibilité des groupes d'expression, mais ça ne se fait pas, ça ne se fait pas parce que ça mélange, mélange les genres. C'était un défaut de fabrication de la loi, si jamais un jour euh, on devait revenir sur… Euh, et refaire les lois aux roues, il faudrait vraiment les faire avec une autre conception de l'ingénierie du dialogue. Euh, c'est trop, trop faible. Le dialogue, c'est trop compliqué pour être euh, laissé, j'allais dire, au, au bon vouloir de la bienveillance et de la sympathie de, des managers. Voilà. C'est un point de vue radical, encore une fois, mais bon, je suis prêt à discuter, bien sûr. Hein voilà. <rire> Merci beaucoup, euh, Yves Clos. Euh, du coup, je ne sais pas s'il y a des questions dans la salle. Il semble qu'il y avait une main levée euh, de Laura, mais il semble qu'elle a disparu. Écoutez, en attendant qu'il qu y ait dans la, dans, des questions dans la salle, peut-être 
peut-être une, une question euh, sans doute moins, peut-être un peu plus, euh, un, peu, un, peu, un peu moins informée en tout cas de ma part. C'est euh, juste pour revenir sur euh, peut-être sur le, le, le postulat de départ, ce que vous disiez sur le fait que euh, on peut tous se réunir euh, euh, autour d'un souci du, euh, de, de, de bien faire son travail, du travail euh, bien fait. Une, euh, une des questions euh, moi, que, qu que j'avais en tête avec, certains, avec euh, des gens avec qui je discutais pour préparer cette, euh, cette, euh, cette, euh, cette conférence, euh, c'est euh, finalement, euh, qu'est-ce qui vous permet de dire que tout le monde souhaite faire du, du bon travail euh, je, je veux dire par là, euh, est-ce que, euh, est que la, 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 finalement la souffrance résulte-t-elle toujours euh, de causes liées à l'absence de dialogue sur le travail N'y a-t-il pas également euh, des, euh, finalement, des causes euh, individuelles à la souffrance euh, sur lesquelles finalement on peut estimer que, euh, que, que l'entreprise a peut-être quelque chose à faire pour, euh, pour aider les gens à, à s'en sortir par euh, l'aménagement euh, de, euh, de leur cadre de travail euh, euh, est-ce que, voilà, est que finalement il n'y a pas aussi des causes individuelles auxquelles l'entreprise peut et doit répondre Oui, on fait toujours pareil, Jean-Yves. <rire> Vas-y. <rire> euh, J'entends je, je, peut-être dans, dans votre question, mais c'est pour être sûr de, de l'avoir bien comprise, euh, que euh, dans ce qu'on dit sur la santé au travail et la manière d'approcher le sujet, ça exclut toute approche individuelle euh, des questions de santé au travail. Est-ce que c'est... Est... Alors, euh, évidemment, je, je, je ne le pense pas. Euh, euh, c'est la manière dont on dit les choses c'est que par contre euh, les, de man... socialement c'est quand même comme ça que massivement les choses sont prises c'est à dire c'est à l'inverse euh, tout, 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 tout n'est qu'une qu affaire individuelle quasiment tout problème de santé au travail est pris du côté enfin on l'a déjà dit en tout cas dans les approches qui sont massivement euh, répandues c'est ça donc, est-ce que ça veut dire que nous, on ne s'intéresse pas ou on considère qu'il n'y a pas de, de, de dimension euh, individuelle de la santé au travail Non, non. Et même, euh, évidemment, que l'entreprise euh, euh, doit, euh, doit y répondre. Mais là encore, même ça, euh, ça mérite d'être instruit dans le rapport. Même, même cette, euh, cette euh, dimension qui pourrait être tout à fait personnelle de, 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 de difficultés, de troubles... Que, 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 et donc, donc du coup, d'une certaine causalité euh, de la situation de la personne qui serait, du, un, disons, un primat donné à ce qui lui arriverait ou à son histoire, etc. Même cette question-là, qu'on ne peut pas écarter, qu'on n'écarte évidemment pas, euh, elle, elle, elle mérite d'être instruite aussi euh, dans le rapport à la fonction psychologique du travail. Euh, j'allais dire euh, une, des fon une des fonctions psychologiques du travail c'est précisément d'intercaler entre soi et son histoire personnelle euh, euh, le métier le boulot qu'on a à faire qui, qui, qui n'est qui est, qui, qui pas euh, qui ne met par définition pas personnel euh, et c'est paradoxalement parce que je, je rentre dans quelque chose qui, 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 qui est dans une histoire qui n'est pas que la mienne euh, que, euh, que, que je peux y jouer quelque chose de moi et que, et que ça, 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 a une, ça a une vertu, j'allais dire, potentiellement thérapeutique. Quand on considère qu'il y a de la causalité euh, euh, personnelle dans tout ça, que ça doit rester personnel, que ça n'a pas de rapport avec le travail, euh, mais néanmoins c'est pris, dans un, dans, dans, euh, pris en compte par une organisation du travail, une institution qui est une institution du travail, là on a un biais, quoi. C'est-à-dire renvoyer uniquement euh, et s'occuper des personnes uniquement du point de vue de leurs problèmes personnels à l'intérieur et, et, et j'allais dire financé euh, par, euh, par une, une organisation du travail qui est dans le cadre d'un rapport de, de subordination enfin bon ça fait des sacs de nœuds quand même tout ça hein, du point de vue de la santé euh, personnelle voilà donc euh, euh, voilà moi j'ai envie de dire évidemment euh, la, 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 la structure le, n'a pas à s'exonérer, n'a pas à ne pas s'intéresser euh, à ce qui arrive euh, 
vraiment aux personnes. Mais euh, dans, ce, dans cette affaire-là, le rapport au travail ne doit pas euh, se taire. Voilà. Standpoint is always the standpoint of a clinician. And I think the mental health of an individual is something which is very personal, an individual. So I'm very wary uh, of companies that want to get involved into their employees' mental health. Your psychological intimacy is too precious for um, just leaving it open to the, the heavy hand uh, or the heavy-handed approach of the organization. Mental health is something which is very personal. And if you think that the company could solve this sort of problems by putting at the, uh, the disposal of uh, employees uh, um, something that could help them to solve their personal problems uh, through the uh, organization of work, I would be very suspicious of this sort of things. I think as a clinician, you, you need to take more precautions. You need to be, to be more careful than that. And my, my concern and, and is, you see, we are psychologists, we are clinicians, Jean-Yves and myself. So I'd say that our approach is that everyone is unique. And so being unique is something which is which you need to look for uh, in your in your job the more unique you are in your in your profession in your job the more efficient you are so looking for singularity and uniqueness of beings is very important and making this a position between the individuals uh, and uh, Uh, the community is meaningless. However, whenever the dialogical perspective is put in place, uh, i.e. you try and work together to come to a solution that is new to all, you create links and gradually each and every one, thanks to this collective work that is performed, Each and every one can play his or her score uh, and contribute to the collective work. The more you have this collective work in place, well, the more there is an individual approach to work because the collective work uh, puts in place a, a dialogue uh, or a, a, a discussion space for each and every one. So experience shows that you, you may then end up by realizing that you are absolutely unique. Uh, all the more when you are faced with collective dialogue. So not only should you uh, accept collective dialogue, You should also realize that it's like training as a musician. You, you just learn and hone your skills. And you could even go a step further. Individual, uh, the individual clinical approach is damaged by this absence of collective dialogue between individuals in society at large. You, you may have this feeling that everything is uh, individualized, but uh, we uh, look more and more alike and we are less and less unique. And it's so important to have this collective work uh, In the, at the, in the workplace because it's so difficult and this is how you can create the collective resources that are necessary for 
each and every one's individual activity. So I would say that collective work is something you need for each and every one to feel more and more himself or herself. And when there are when there is less collective work, well, people look alike more and more. You see, uh, they look like clones when there's no collective work at play, which is a par paradox. And it's a catastrophe. People just look alike, like, you know, uh, uh, just as many peas in a, in a box because there, there's, no, there's no collective work. Controversy is not just making sure that the uh, you know those who are very vocal are going to uh, grab attention. No, not at all. And if we want to avoid uh, looking alike, being clones, uh, well, the most important thing we can do is to make sure that uh, we can uh, create the, the the necessary conditions for this collective work to happen. Um, now, there's a question from Ronnie, uh, and uh, can you hear us clearly? Good evening. I find your approach so interesting, and it does resonate with a, a large part of my experience. So thank you very much for putting this framework in place. However, there's one thing that I failed to grasp about this conflict of criteria, and more particularly in light of what you've just said. I do agree with you uh, on this paradox uh, that leads to, uh, to you know, more and more individualization leads to people looking more and more alike. I, I do agree with this. Um, however, your approach, when faced with this paradox, don't you think that your approach uh, should be to accept the fact that uh, all criteria are just as good as one another? So when, wh what do you mean exactly by the uh, conflict uh, of criteria or contra contradictory criteria, uh, for instance, uh, uh, in the case of MSF, when we recruit someone new, uh, do you think that uh, we should take into account the uh, criterion of motivation, of personal ethics, or should we base ourselves on the, uh, on the person's skills, availability, because uh, this is also something which is important in humanitarian action. And is it possible to have people with a, a set of criteria filling the same position as others with another uh, approach, another set uh, of criteria? Thank you very much, Ronnie. And I'm going to give the floor to Jean-Yves Bonnefond and Yves Clouf. Yves, do you want to uh, answer? Yves, can you hear us? I'm very sorry. I couldn't hear Ronnie uh, Broman very well. So if you could hear him better, maybe you could, you could start. And then uh, I'll try to say a few, a few words. Now, I'm not so sure I grasped everything uh, Ronnie said about the uh, conflicts of criteria. And, well, maybe we could ask him for a clarification. Um, I understand that he asks us about the conflicts of criteria. or conflicting criteria applying to people to be recruited by MSF and criteria that uh, would be... I, I find it a bit difficult to understand, very frankly. 
uh, based on our practice, and maybe it's something which is highly specific to MSF and the five knots. Uh, this is a humanitarian commitment. And frankly, we're, we're not in our, uh, well, zone of comfort, I'd, I'd say. Uh, it's not our field of expertise. However, in the uh, environment, in the settings where we work, the, these criteria we are referring to are uh, criteria uh, corresponding to your trade, to your profession, to, uh, but it's not criteria that would apply to recruitment. Uh, for instance, in, in the, the film we showed you, the uh, métier ambassador isn't even a, a, a Renault uh, employee. He's just a temp worker with just lots of experience. And the other thing also is uh, is to know whether all criteria are uh, have the same weight or worth. And I'm just thinking aloud here, but I'd say that uh, it all depends on the situation, and each situation is uh, is different. and should take advantage of the existing criteria. And depending on your take on the situation, maybe some criteria that were not uh, relevant uh, could become more relevant or even critical. So not all criteria are equal. And I think it all depends on, on, the, on the situation. And for instance, Judith, uh, uh, gave us a, 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 a text to read. And for instance, arbit arbitration between uh, security of the uh, of staff and the mission and quality of care provided to the population. Well, I, I, I assume that your, uh, your, the trade-off you strike is not always the same depending on your, on your setting or the project you're in. What I mean is that some criteria that may be set aside or overlooked in one case uh, would become highly critical in another. Uh, well, hopefully uh, this makes sense. Now, I'm not so sure that I, I understood everything here because you see the, the situation is a bit difficult and by the way, I'd like to thank the, the technici technicians for for their uh, for for uh, you know managing to organize this video conference. But of course, it's not easy when we are not all together in the same room. Now, so my take on this about recruitment at MSF, and of course, I can see that. Uh, skills and competencies and expertise and experience uh, uh, and being a seasoned uh, uh, professional is something that uh, is at the forefront. Or should you give priority to commitment, ethics, uh, and very often uh, uh, ethics is uh, confused with the moral conduct, which is different, of course. But of course, the, these. So the question is this one: uh, Is this uh, conflict of criteria to uh, when it comes to recruiting someone? Is it subject to discussions uh, within the uh, human resources department? Because, but it's not just a matter of human resources. Obviously, it's also something that uh, is uh, is to be uh, is to be uh, uh, managed by the uh, the top management as well and where can you, could you have these discussions on uh, the conflicts uh, or conflicting criteria and you see I, I want to say that in our world well at least in the companies uh, we know well uh, everything is uh, regulated or everything is governed by the 
subordination uh, link uh, by the uh, labor contract. And of course, those who uh, have the upper hand uh, are going to enforce their position because they are the ones who can recruit you and pay you, and um, they will have a say, obviously. So I think uh, all of us, we, we, we know where we stand. We, 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 we don't think that uh, you know, everything is rosy. We don't wear rosy, uh, rosy uh, glasses. glasses. We, we know that subordination is uh, included in all uh, labor contracts. However, whenever you facilitate uh, discussions and controversies, uh, con regarding conflicting criteria. It's like uh, calling into question this, uh, this uh, link of subordination and you, uh, f you promote freedom and you give people the ability and the authorization to call into question the, um, the choices that are made. And, of course, uh, uh, I want to be very careful because I'm not s uh, saying that you, that you should encourage re rebellion uh, or insurgency uh, within the uh, MSF. But if you want to, um, to promote health uh, at work, you should run the risk of calling into question the subordination link, which is not something that is tantamount to chaos. It's just the uh, making it possible to uh, allow people to come up with their professional rules. And it means that you see so this uh, calling into question of the uh, hierarchical link is the, like the, 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 the checks and balances. Uh, and it does produce something which is organized. But generally speaking, I'd say that all criteria are not alike, are not equal. Some of them are imposed by the hierarchy, by the subordination link. But conflicting criteria uh, make it possible to have more leeway, more freedom. And of course, this is why uh, uh, we don't want to do away with labor contracts. It's not our, our job, of course. It's not our aim. Uh, I think, but I think we need to be uh, we need to be aware that uh, uh, conflicts are uh, ubiquitous, uh, and you need to be aware of that. And you need to pick your uh, your 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 areas. Uh, and our our aim as clinicians is to facilitate calling into question the uh, hierarchical link in order to facilitate uh, uh, discussions. Because we think it's a way of uh, also making it uh, a lively, uh, alive or coming alive. The conflicting uh, or the conflicts, uh, using conflicts of criteria is the school of freedom. And it's always something which is very important if you just want to avoid being uh, just blinded, blindfolded. And of course, uh, I, I like to end with a question to Ronnie, and of course you, 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 of course you can refuse to answer my question. But do you think that this conflict of criteria is uh, gives rise to uh, controversy within the HR and also between HR and the operational directorates? Yes, it's uh, what's important in any association is the relationship between the operational directors and the HR, and also working uh, in management. Uh, again, then if it's left to open dialogue, then there's po it's very possible to be able to overcome some of these troubles. So thank you, Eve. I don't know if Rony wants to come back on that. Uh, 
I think your answer is very interesting. Uh, but I also wanted to specify in in your answer about the the uh, I am personally very opposed uh, to this uh, this uh, this uh, this criteria these these contradictory criteria because uh, it seems in my mind it's not it's, it can't be as part of the same process uh, and that if we talk about the motivation of uh, of a person who is being recruited by MSF, I think it's an aspect of it which is very important, but it's a contradictory criteria nonetheless in some cases. And uh, often uh, uh, it is transformed by experience, and that was sort of the subjacent to my my question. But there were controversies uh, at MSF but I remember two or three discussions that we had on this question was addressed and uh, it could be it could be translated as it could be even called tragic the the way with the outcomes of them and it seems to me it's important to, to know it's because it enables us to know better with the with the appropriate words and uh, to, to, but uh, does a decision have to be made in a, in a certain way Uh, I have a very difficult time uh, understanding what Ronnie was saying because the sound wasn't very good. That's Eve uh, Close saying that. But on these issues, we weren't able to go into details on it. But I think controversies are very, very good if we have a good basis and a, a good understanding between uh, the capacity for people to be able to discuss with one another. Because because of the methodological experience that we had, it makes it possible to push uh, co controversies fairly, fairly far without causing damage. Even from a psychological uh, point of view, even if a psycholo psychologist that I'm the, that is the idea of motivating uh, motivation, it's not motivation which is going to produce the activity. But it's something, and I didn't hear because the sound isn't very good, but uh, it is the conferences by, uh, among psychologists or something. Uh, donc Jean Guy, Guy Jean Guy Vatou. Uh, I'm sorry that I'm going to slow up, slow up the conversation. I didn't understand the beginning. That that is work that's well done. How can we do it? What's what? Why is that a key too uh, to good health at work? Is it is it a matter of perception? Is it the performance, or, or is it the feeling of, of work well done? But at the same time, I think I have watched uh, both films and the operators talking among themselves was the practice, and so they discussed with the with, with the uh, with the. Uh, with the work with the workshop foreman, I remember that about the quality of the in the 1980s uh, at MSF, and the 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 sole objective of that was to be able to overcome conflict. When you talk about work that's well done, and how can that be linked with MSF? This question about work well done, uh, 
it's kind of complicated, but everyone uh, is uh, in inhabited with the uh, concern of, do of working well, doing good work, and to challenge that is completely legitimate. To, to as a form of answer that is that everybody has a taste of effectiveness, has a taste for uh, effectiveness, to do something cheaper, and to get to the end of the job, with in as as efficiently as possible for each individual, if it's only for their own uh, economy. But it doesn't define work well done, I agree, but there is a relation to effectiveness. After that, there's the work itself, the, uh, the, the commodity, because it's a social c commodity, and asserted, uh, objectified as part of the criteria that have to be preponderant in the, in the, on the finished project and the care given uh, as, uh, as at MSF. And you alluded uh, in the film, you saw th that uh, for the automatic gestures and, and your right to, to, uh, to bring them together is that how can we stop uh, the, uh, poor work? And so it's the passage from uh, the f the assembly line, Ford kind of assembly line, and there's a problem of equality and the division of work. It's radical, the, o the, o the operator. And uh, uh, from the po point of view of the definition of the organization of work, and this produ products, produces the mass production, but it caused a lot of, uh, of damage uh, on the quality of that, uh, because, and that's very dis, dis, de, uh, debatable. But uh, authoritarianism also fails be, uh, specifically because it, it harms collective work necessary Uh, on the real work, but also, uh, also on the possible subversion or the challenging of the criterion. But uh, uh, in here, uh, we uh, we seek the best to to give value, analyze uh, work situations which are problematic, and that uh, uh, if and the uh, the workstation perhaps has to be rearranged. If when you looked at the film, you're in an organization which is is confirmed as uh, an, a line management, uh, a line manufacturing. It, it's sort of the American version, which has been globalized uh, by Ford, uh, which, uh, which also uh, is a school well beyond factories now because there's an intelligence, operational intelligence, that has to be uh, matched with the requirements of the product to be produced. And it's in this organization there, where there, there, on paper, it's like that. The operators hear you in the beginning, uh, are not on paper those are, who have no uh, they have they have no uh, legitimate place in in the process now in the facts it's completely wiped out for reasons of uh, the only criteria of performance uh, for the client and also the, the ratio with and everything that may challenge at the time of collective work and thinking about the job and the criteria which are proper to the operations, the operators. Uh, if, if the job uh, harms people, uh, he's going to be hurt and there's going to be somebody else to take his place. Uh, and it's not necessarily going to uh, improve the production process. Uh, so the idea of Toyotism, uh, like in Toyota, 
it's not a it's not a Toyota it's not a, a Toyota solution. This is why we see these operators who uh, uh, and also prevail with a certain criteria in relation to the quality of the work and the quality of the work as it can be to to save one's energy as well and the performance with the job and also the the finished product we're talking about the intermediary uh, 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 spare parts here when we talked about the uh, th that we saw with in the car factory Uh, work well done uh, blends the quality of the finished product, uh, the quality of one zone's activity. That shows, in my way, that uh, according to my own criteria, uh, there are a lot of parameters that uh, enter into it, and the quality of the work equals dialogue, how I can talk with my co-worker and with my chain of command, and uh, the work that has to be done as it should get to that point. I really agree. Uh, that everybody is trying to save themselves, economize uh, with themselves. Uh, the concern of uh, work well done is, is in operational terms. What is spontaneous is not the desire to work well, but it's not a moral point of view. The people are spontaneously oriented toward, uh, directed toward uh, working well. I'm not understanding what he's saying. But uh, does the work have to be redone, for example, if it's not well properly done? These are the difficulties of real activities, which are the source of the, of the concerns of, of for doing a good job. And it's the spontaneous point of view on that, uh, that I'm not talking about morality here. We're talking about, we're just talking about the spontaneity of uh, sometimes challenging uh, habits. Uh, what what makes crea uh, creativity is to be able to save one's energy by doing the best job possible, and uh, d d uh, it helps uh, people think about other things, things that where they're thinking out of the box a little bit. Now the re the answer. The, when we talk about work well done, I'm talking about the uh, co the conflicts, because work is conflict. Uh, clearly, uh, uh, about the activities, which is uh, which is uh, something. I didn't. Sorry, I didn't catch it. Uh, to feel that we're not going to spare one's energies uh, leads to fatigue, leads to illness, poor health. But work well done uh, leads to a, a, a good product uh, and, the ser and, and the service is rendered and the There is also the objectivity of the performance as well, and that's an important element in uh, an individual psychology. Uh, so I want to uh, uh, stress the fact uh, for the psychology of the individual to pose a criteria of objective uh, of performance. That is how in uh, tests and trials, it, uh, work that's well done is conflictual, necessarily, except that the fact of not, uh, to not harm one's health uh, can be opposed to the performance criteria. It's le legitimate and discussable. Uh, 
so the criteria, the, uh, the conflict criteria, uh, is something is definitive because there's no social system that can handle that kind of thing. Each, each time, uh, e each time uh, the energy is abused of individual workers, then the their uh, health suffers, and uh, the the employee reference person, for example, the professional uh, reference person, for example, in a situation like that, can can uh, attenuate a little bit, mitigate the uh, the uh, uh, the troubles experienced by each individual. There are performances and performances. There's the quality of the of the product, and also there are the means of arriving at at a proper product. We we perceive that uh, when health is uh, in contradiction with uh, with the health when the health is in contradiction to the work itself, then obviously the job itself has to be rethought. About the saving one's energy and the savings of the means. Uh, the financial people to think that they are only talk about savings at work, uh, but it is nonetheless a, a strange perception. Human life is completely inhabited by by uh, saving one's energy. Not the savings of things or means, but it's rather a sort of an anthropological point of view. And uh, the fact of attaining one's objectives. But when you have the question, uh, uh, but I'm sorry that my answers are so long, but I'm sorry, I've just the sound is just too fuzzy to be able to do a good job. So we're, we're arriving at the end of, of this discussion. We'll take a final question by, by Nadia, and to try, and we'll try to respond very briefly so that we can finish pretty much on time. Merci pour vous. No, thank you. I'll try and be brief. What you said uh, uh, really resonates in me because I, I've been a journalist and I work as a humanitarian now. And I can see that work is painful. And when I mean work, I mean the organization of work. But the freedom you were mentioning, the the, the possibility to renew and reinvent new things to work is something that really uh, 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 lies uh, close to my heart. But who among us can uh, trigger this change? I can see some of my colleagues uh, being caught in this difficult situation, but also uh, afraid, um, afraid in an organization that doesn't allow collective work. And even despite all these reports on well-being, nothing is done to touch upon this question of organization. So I'd like to see fewer of my colleagues suffering. So who should or who can trigger this change or give the start the momentum uh, should it come from the top? In which case, uh, we may have to wait a bit. I think there are lots of good debates, and it may be that we're going to uh, uh, go down the, the, the right uh, sort of road. Uh, I think there's awareness, obviously, uh, but there are facts and facts which can't be uh, overlooked. A new organization of work should be uh, laid out, but who can uh, 
give the uh, take the initiative or give these uh, give in, uh, this impulse towards a new organization. Now I'll try and be short because uh, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll say something and maybe Jean Yves will uh, maybe I'll stand corrected by Jean Yves. We'll see. I can't really see you on my screen anymore. It's. Um, Because this is just born out of the uh, conflict of uh, criteria, you have to look at it from different sides. What we're trying to say here, it's not about the choice of organization in our book, for instance. Uh, what we describe are organizations that uh, decided to um, uh, get in touch with us so that they could uh, lead these experiments. So these, uh, these choices, these decisions are made by the management. So it's up to the top management to, uh, uh, to stop sitting on their hands and uh, do things and take action. Of course, you can't just rely on spontaneous uh, initiatives taken by professionals. You can't just rely on them. Not everything can change thanks to them. The organization of work is uh, also something that should be uh, uh, changed by the, uh, by the top management. They, they have the possibility to change the way work is organized and which is at the very heart of everything we're seeing here. And in the uh, short footage, you, you could see, you know, it, it may look like something very, uh, uh, very, uh, very simple, very basic, but it does mean a lot because it meant uh, having managers attending the meeting and coming to realize that the way the shafts were presented to the uh, workers uh, wasn't uh, convenient at all. But it means that you have to listen to people. You have to allow them to speak out and make sure that their messages are, um, are, are forwarded to the management. And the problems are, are exposed. But the problem is not to make sure that this is done. Uh, it's not the uh, bottom-up forwarding of problem, which is uh, the good way of dealing with it. It's making sure that those at the top come down and talk to those who do the job. And it's the possibility for those people who do the, the job on the you know, day in, day out to be the ones to determine the agenda. And then the top managers should, you know, just go down and put their resources at the disposal of the, uh, of the collective, uh, of the community. And of course, this touches upon the organization of work. And obviously, this is something that should be decided upon by the, uh, by the management, by the top management. However, for this to happen, uh, it means that... You need a collective, uh, a, a collective approach to be, uh, to be uh, in motion for the organization of work to be transformed. Even if these uh, collective uh, teams uh, uh, do not have, uh, do not hold uh, power, but for uh, for power over individuals uh, dec to. Uh, to decrease, it means that people are, uh, are, are have more uh, authority on things, on, on the job to be done. 
And very often, power is something which becomes very deleterious, very harmful, because those who do the job, uh, the the people who are uh, who who really are the professionals, have no say whatsoever in the decisions that are made. And this means, of course, that one shouldn't be afraid to to discuss and to. Uh, Need some con- to, or to, to have some controversies. I think they, you know, uh, uh, the, uh, the, I think the the collective or the community, the work community, does exist only if you can tell your your colleague, well, I'm sorry, but the, you know, this is sloppy job. You, you, the job is not properly done. You didn't do the job properly, and I think it's very important. This is what is noble in the work all of us do every day. But if the the work community has no authority whatsoever, even if the top management make uh, everything possible to listen to people, but you know sometimes you think that it's good enough to just listen to people. Well, sometimes it's not good enough, and. You know, either everybody speaks for himself or herself, and that's you know it doesn't lead to anything. Or you you don't you are not legitimate to oppose uh, some of the uh, criteria that do not uh, that do not respect uh, health requirements or um, the um, a, a good organisation. So. This is my my appeal, as it were, to to create a new new relationship between the different uh, elements in the organisation. It means that uh, professionals should have a say and should have some authority over things, so that the organisation of work can be transformed into this conflictual cooperation. You need conflicts and cooperation. And for that, you need uh, the top management to take the initiative. Well, uh, at least, you know, uh, the good thing at MSF is that the problem is uh, has been put on the table. And it's not that frequent. So I think it, we should pay tribute to, uh, to, the, to that. So thank you. No, oh, thank you. And on this last comment, uh, I think, uh, well, we, we may not have reached a conclusion, but I, I think we've come to the end of our discussion for tonight. I'd like to thank uh, Yves Clou and Jean-Yves Bonnefond for their contributions and having shared their Um, their thoughts with us and I do invite all of you to buy this book The Price of a Job Well Done so as to learn more about what you what you experience with the for instance the waste collection department in Lille or a nursing home or Renault thank you very much to the organizers Uh, Judith Sousson Sabrina Djibari and Elba Ramuni, uh, Crash, and Joel Ramelo and Jeremy Giordano are two technicians who've done a, a wonderful job so that we could organize this conference despite the health uh, uh, requirements. And thank you very much to our two interpreters, uh, Tim Fox and Carmine Mandron. Um, and this conference will be available uh, uh, on replay. I can see people nodding, so obviously as of tomorrow, it'd be available on the uh, CRASH website. Thank you and good evening to all. <laughs>